On the 3rd of December, 1595, the furrier Samuel Probst entered the ring to fence with Longsword, as part of a victual that was taking place in the dancing hall of his home city of Augsburg. The next day he had to appear in front of the city councillors on suspicion of manslaughter, for during that Longsword match he hit his opponent on the head, who then later died of his injuries. Hello there, Oscar from Virtual Factually here. Now today I've got a really cool bit of historical context for you. Someone dying during a fencing match. This was not supposed to happen, obviously, but this should raise a couple of questions. First off, what on earth happened? And secondly, was this a common occurrence or rather more of a freak accident? I'll be trying to answer those questions as well as the sources will allow me to do, but before we dive into that, I'd like to also point out that this video was made in conjunction with an article that I've written for the Dutch HEMA Federation. It's in Dutch, but I'll provide a link down below. And also, uh, an immense debt of gratitude is owed to uh, a couple of people within the board of the Dutch HEMA Federation who helped me a lot. First off, the idea for examining this particular case came from Kasper van Dijk, who mentioned to me, uh, this to me uh, a while back. And secondly, Pim Baten, who was also on the board, uh, lent me his uh, expertise as a medical student for, uh, in order to see whether we could glean some ideas for the cause of death of Probst's opponent during the fencing match. Now, having said that, let's dive straight into it. Now, we know about this particular occurrence because the councillors of Augsburg get really meticulous records of all the court cases that came in before them. And although their methods will probably raise quite a few outbreaks nowadays, they use torture and very loaded questions, for instance, their main goal here is still to find out the truth of the matter, so to figure out what the hell happened, so to speak. In the case of Probst and his opponent that was killed during the fencing match, they seem to mainly want to establish whether Probst was acting deliberately or whether this was an accident. That, however, is not to say that they do not really have any ulterior motives during their questioning of the accused, because it had been quite a while since the councillors of Augsburg had allowed effectually to take place. These events were known to be quite rowdy, they would attract visitors from outside of town and the councillors generally considered to them to be rather violent uh, events, so they would rather forbid them and outlaw them in entirety. Now, to see that during the first fechtune in quite a long time someone immediately loses their life, that is something that is worth looking into according to the councillors of the city of Augsburg. Now, for those of you who would like to actually read the sources themselves, I'll provide a link down below to Antlossi's Anthology of Sources on Reformation Era Augsburg. But there's a couple of really interesting things that we can glean from them and I'd like to present to you. For starters, the defense is pretty clear and consistent. Samuel Probst the, says that he did not know his opponent and that there was no previous enmity between them. Furthermore, when the councillors press on and try to imply that his fencing style was too rough and too hard, he says that he was fencing according to his art and that he was doing no things that were forbidden during the factory. Now, this assertion of the accused is also supported by the testimony given by the fencing masters and the organizing party of the factory, because they uh, say that Probst was fencing again according to the art and that he was neither thrusting nor using the pommel nor running into his opponent. This seems to indicate that the match, match itself was done pretty much according to the rules and nothing untoward happened there. Another interesting thing mentioned by the fencing masters is that they did not know for certain why Probst's opponent died after the fencing match, but that they did hear that he was a very heavy bleeder. Now, interesting as all these facts may be, they will of course not allow us to make a full 100% exact reconstruction of the event, but they might help us answer our questions at least partially. So first off, why did Samuel Probst's adversary die after the fencing match? Well, I've asked him and um, he gave a couple of plausible explanations for the deadly end of this fight. Now the first and most obvious suspect here would of course be a brain hemorrhage as a result of an overly hard strike to the temple with a sword. However, the testimony given by the fencing master seems to contradict this as they said that the um, fight was conducted according to all the rules of fencing. So one would not expect the hit to be too hard. Now, a brain hemorrhage would also be accompanied by a number of other symptoms such as passing in and out of consciousness, throwing up and seizures, none of which are mentioned in the sources. Now, another plausible explanation is that the sword strike would have opened up a blood vessel that runs through the temple. 
if Tavo Brooks, the opponent, would have had a closing this turn, that might have meant that the open blood vessels, in the end, could have actually killed him. Now, it's really impossible from the limited data that we have to fully reconstruct what happened here, but at the very least, most of what we know seems to point that the strike with the longsword during the fencing match did actually kill Samuel Probst, his opponent. Now, at this point, we have to take a step back and ask ourselves, wait a minute, bleeding head wounds. Is this a common occurrence during a fact shoot? And the answer to that is a resounding yes. This was generally the victory condition. The person striking the highest bleeding wound during a fencing match was the one who won that match. Generally, these fencing matches consisted of a certain number of rounds, or genga as they were known back then. And these rounds, in turn, consisted of a set number of strikes. Now, it's not fully clear how many strikes that was supposed to be. Uh, most sources seem to indicate that it's about 8 strikes, but we're not sure whether that's 8 strikes for each fencer or 8 strikes in total. Now, after a hit, the gang would still continue, and only after that set number of strikes had been reached, then presumably the fences would separate, um, take a small breather, and then continue for the next gun. Um, in Prague, we know, for instance, that the Fechtrul tended to, uh, to have matches of three gang, but anything of up to nine Gengen has been attested to in sources as well. Going for these bleeding head wounds was very strongly incentivized during Fechtrule. There is this one case of a Fechtrule in Brzeg in 1582, where any fencer who managed to get a bleeding head wound on their opponent would get a small money prize. And that led especially the Dusak fencers to go really hard, so they tried to bludgeon each other um, until their heads started bleeding. Which unfortunately didn't happen too much, so most of the Dusak fencers had to drop out because their faces got so swollen that they couldn't properly see anymore. And interestingly, this can also be attested to in some of the fight books we have at the time. And I'm specifically referring to Das Andertal des Neuen Kunstreichen Fechtbuchs, uh, which is sometimes known as the Bleeding Big Guy book. It shows uh, some late 16th century fencing with longsword, with I think halberd or staff, and of course the Dusak. And interestingly, the bleeding head wounds are all over the place, except with Dusak. Make of that what you will. So a Fechtschule could be quite a risky business, as we've seen. However, participants were expected to obey the rules to the letter. And anyone who disregarded these rules that were there for their own safety were generally punished quite severely. In Prague, for instance, offenders who disregarded the rules would get a monetary fine, or in some cases even be beaten with a shovel that was kept in the fencing schule grounds for that occasion specifically. Now, when it comes to the Augsburg Fechtschule, we don't really know how many Gänge uh, those fights were supposed to be, how many strikes were there supposed to be in every gang, and we also don't know exactly what the rules of engagement were. But there's really no reason to assume that this Fechtschule was really that different from others that were taking place all around the general area at that time. Now, this would mean that the strike that Samuel Probst gave his opponent to the temple was indeed according to the art of fencing. Now, the councillors of Augsburg seem to agree with this reading of the event, because several days later, after they had collected all the testimonies, they fully acquitted Samuel Prost, who then went on to recede back into the mists of history. Now, this is a really interesting historical case, with, with a lot of possible things that you can read into it. But for me, the biggest takeaway is that people in the past really did have a different sense of risk mitigation and health and safety than we do. So it's very important to keep that in mind when we're trying to reconstruct these historical fencing treatises. Anyway, I really hope you liked this video. I put a lot of time and energy in it. Um, let me know what you think, even if you disliked it. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Finally, a huge thank you to all my patrons. Your support has been really crucial in pumping out ever more videos and I'm really enjoying it, so thanks a lot. Anyway, stay safe, keep fencing. I'll catch you in the next one.